All right, good morning, everybody. And welcome to our uh, Bible class. We are in session six. So if you have your Bible lesson, and we are in Acts chapter eight, if you're watching online, we welcome you. And uh, turn to Acts chapter eight, um, where we are now moving, excuse me, I lost this, where we're moving to where the gospel is moving to Samaria and beyond, okay? Good morning, ladies. So, so let's uh, begin with the hymn. Uh, Penny, you want to read verse 1, please? God, who's almighty. God, who's almighty word, chaos and darkness, darkness heard. And took their flight, hear us, we humbly pray. And where the gospel goes, sheds not its glorious way, let there be light. And everybody, would you please? Lord, who once came to bring on your redeeming wing healing and sight, health to the sick in mind, sight to the inly blind, oh, now to humankind, let there be light. Okay. Uh, look down at the bottom where it says, my personal study for the week. Approximately five years have passed since the day of Pentecost. See that? in our text for the day, I did not realize that. A new phase of growth is about to begin. What looks like a deterrent, cruel persecution, becomes instead a means of expansion. Okay? All right, let us uh, begin our study with Acts chapter one. Everybody there? Acts, cha uh, Acts chapter eight, what did I say? Yes. All right, let me read. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Whose death is that? Stephen. Stephen, yeah, okay. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison, okay? So last week our study was, of course, Stephen's, um, what do you call that? Stephen's stoning, his trial uh, before the Sanhedrin, and his argument was that the, the kingdom of God isn't focused on the temple, Okay, but it is focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the new temple of God. Everybody remember that? So now, after the killing of Stephen, come, uh, Saul is there, a great persecution broke out against the church. Okay, so uh, what do we learn from this? Well, what do we learn from this, of these opening verses? about persecution in the kingdom of God. Nothing Not, Not, yeah, persecution is a good, a good thing for the kingdom of God. Now, isn't that bizarre? Who would have thought that? Persecution for the kingdom of God actually produces growth. And by the way, many of us do not know our early church history but if you look at the early church up until 325 A.D., the church expanded and grew primarily through persecution. The martyrs, people like Polycarp and others who were killed because of their faith. And the folks around saw the devotion of the believers. They were so impressed that that led many to the faith. I'm here to tell you, I think we as American Christians could use a little persecution. I'm serious. And I, I'm, I'm serious. I think it may come uh, where the church is and the message of the gospel is repressed by the state or others. That may be the best thing that happens to Christendom. It'll separate the believers from the unbelievers and it will be a evidence of the faith and the power of God at work. You ever think about those things? 
You know, I brought that up. I brought that up to pastors in gatherings. And, you know, they always think, well, what's the future going to hold? And one of my favorite questions is, are you ready to go underground? <laughs> Seriously. I don't know if I'll ever see that. You know, we were at, our sister congregation had their 75th wedding, an, our 75th wedding, wedding anniversary. Uh, anniversary. They were founded in 1945. There wasn't much here in 19, was anybody here in 1945? You were. You were here. Okay, but you were here in the valley at Burbank. Okay, nobody else was here. Isn't that interesting? We're all Midwest, right? For those of us who are older than 75. Oh, you were here, right? Not in Okay, not in 45. That's right. But think of how the world has changed. And how the kingdom of God, how, the, how America has changed in 75 years. Just think about that. Right after the war, okay? I was not alive then. You were, right? And how that affected our world, our America, wasn't it? And we came together as a country during that time, if I remember. And that lasted for years, right? That unity. I wonder what the kingdom of God in America will be like in 75 years. That will be 2095. I know I won't be here. No, the world won't be here. You don't think so? No. Oh, how many of you think the world will come to an end this century? You, three of us, wow. The rest of you, you don't think so. Oh, now I think, uh, personally, I, I personally, I have, this, I have this conversation all the time, what's gonna happen in America? And there's a couple of possibilities. One is a revival, okay? One is everything could collapse, which has happened over the course of history, right? I, I wonder whether life as we know it will be the same. I tend to believe it will not be, okay? With all of our advancements, I, I don't know. All right, I don't, anyway, so we learn from this that persecution is good. They are scattered. Notice where they're scattered. From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. Everybody see that? So up until this time, primarily, where did the believers live? Around Jerusalem, in the surrounding area. At least that's the impression we have. And now they are scattering. All right. Notice also uh, verse, uh, what is it, verse, two, verse 3. Saul begins to destroy the church. Yes. Uh, what's the word? The word there is laid waste. To lay waste. Boy, that's a strong word. And Saul, or Saul was a zealot for the ancestral traditions of Israel. Correct? We've had this conversation many times. Now notice his persecution. What does he do? Look at verse 3. Yes, that's, that's the first thing. What's the second? Men and women. Now think about this. House to house probably means that's where the believers were meeting. Right? They didn't have churches. They weren't probably going to synagogues. They were meeting in house. So Saul goes house to house and drags out men and women. I have a note here that says this was most extraordinary in Jewish circles that they would drag out and arrest, put in prison women. Yeah, but just think of yeah, just think about that though. Yes, dragging people out, and men and women, and putting them in prison. Wow, wow. Yeah, what happened to the children? That's right. Good question. All right, uh, let me read this. Um, all right, let's move on. Now Philip. Remember Philip? Where do we? Where did we meet Philip? No, he's one of, no, he's one of the seven probably in chapter 6 if you remember the seven that were chosen to work on tables. Remember that? Yeah, okay. Philip is mentioned first. Okay, yeah, probably probably the Philip from the book of Acts. All right? So he go he and by the way, he is a Grecian Jew. Okay? He's he's not a Hebraic Jew. 
All right? Let me read. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out and out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city, okay? So here we have, and I'm going to guess that there were probably others who left, okay, and went out to various areas, and this is one that was chosen, that Philip leaves and goes to Samaria. Now, what do you know about the Samaritans? You got any footnotes on the Samaritans in your Bibles? They said half Jew and half yeah, they were half-breeds. <laughs> I have a note here that says, yeah, they were regarded as religious half-breeds. Okay? Foreign settlers. All right? And I have another note here that says that this was a bold action on Philip's part. You know? Remember last week we talked about the the tension between the Hebraic Jewish believers and the Grecian Jewish believers? Okay? All right. Uh, Anything else I want to share? All right. Philip goes to a city in Samaria. All right. Let's go on. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city. We assume that's the city where Philip was. And amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. Say they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. All right, let's stop. This guy is known as Simon Magus, the Great. Anybody have a footnote on him? Let me, let's hear what you have written about him. Anybody? Nothing in your footnotes? Oh my gosh. Okay, let's go back to this. Look at, look, read verse 9 and 10 to yourself and tell me the qualities of this Simon Magus. Magus, Magus. No, just his qualities. Just read it to yourself. And and what are the qualities of this guy? Yeah. Sorcerer. Sorcerer, okay. Uh, He had great power. Astrology. Does it mention astrology at all? (laughs) Not really. Okay. But let's go through this. He practiced sorcery, and what did he do? (laughs) He amazed everybody. And he boasted that he was great, great, right? And all the people gave him what? Great attention and exclaimed, this man has what? Read it. Divine Divine power. Okay? And, And is known as the great power. So what did they do? They followed him because he he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. So what kind of guy do you think he was? Think he was humble? No. Here, here we learn something about the powers of darkness. The powers of darkness are always the opposite of the powers of light. Darkness is braggadocious, claiming to be great. People follow you, and you love that, Right? What's the powers of God, the powers of light? A humble spirit. They're not following me. They're following the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that, people. Think about the difference between darkness versus light. This guy is in the world of darkness. And by the way, when you come across people, When you come across people like this, you should be aware of that. Okay? You should be aware of that. I have had this conversation recently with people. Am I okay? Are we all right? 
I've had this conversation with people that you, how can you tell what's of God and what's not? Well, what is of Satan is always the opposite of light. Braggadocious, taking the glory for yourself, right? And, and welcoming how people adore me and follow me. And you know who has a problem with that? Yeah, Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know who has a problem with that? Now hang on. The Democrats. Oh, no. Oh, come on. Let it go. Some preachers. Some preachers can have a problem with that. Where? Oh, yeah. Because how wonderful I am. And look at all the followers that I have. Think about that. Look at all, look at, they're packing in the place. I, mu I must be what? Important, okay? You, by the way, let me just tell you that as you deal with things in the world, you, are, you should be able to learn the difference between darkness and light. I'll give you another clue. Darkness is always chaotic. It doesn't make sense. It, it just crazy. God's ways are orderly. They make sense. They're generally peaceful. Okay? The darkness breeds chaos. Everybody understand that? Okay. All right, let's go on here. So here we have this guy, and he has great power. He, by the way, he is mentioned as Simon Magus, M-A-G-U-S, Simon the Sorcerer, uh, he uh, has great power. Everybody was amazed at him. The Grand Vizier. He was a channel of divine power and revelation. Right? No. He was the channel of what? Thank you. Demonic power. And you know, one of the things that amazes me, a lot of people in the world who don't think the power of darkness is real. Really? Wow. But think about that. In a personal being of Satan. Okay. Yeah, but think about not, not thinking, not believing that there's no evil. I mean, I don't know what world you live in, but uh, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious, obvious too. Yeah. Oh, the other thing is sin. I had this happen recently. What do you mean I sin? It's not sin, this or that. It's a choice. I choose that. That doesn't mean it's a sin. It's my truth. It's my, it's my choice. It's my truth. What do you mean it's, it's wrong? Wait till you are confronted with that in your life. It's not wrong. By the way, it's hard to teach the catechism without revealing what? Sin. sin. <laughs> kind of hard, don't you think? All right, let's move on. Where are we here? Am I? All right, verse 11. So they followed him because he had amazed them. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Peter everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. This is one of the most unusual sections in the book of Acts. What's going on here? Well, the people are amazed at Philip because of his signs and wonders. Because of his signs and wonders. Even Simon Magus is amazed, and he believes in him. Now, I'm, I'm interesting the word believe. We have to be careful how we understand the word believe, okay? All right? So they believe in him, Simon himself, and he followed P Peter, Philip everywhere because he was astonished by what? The signs and miracles. Notice he wasn't astonished by what? The Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about following a faith healer in today's world. 
because he, he or she can heal. Now think about that. That can be dangerous, can't it? That can be very dangerous. All right, let's move on. Uh, it sounds suspicious, doesn't it? Huh? That's, it seems suspicious. At least that's what my note says, so it must be true. All right, so now, now we come to the next section, and this is really a smart thing, okay? And we want to talk about this in the church. Verse 14. When the apostles in Samaria, or in Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to that. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, whose Simon is that? That's Simon Magus, okay? Not Simon Peter. Simon yeah, the sorcerer. He offered them money. Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Sounds suspicious, doesn't it? And notice, old Peter, he's pretty smart. Discerning the spirits here, people. May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Notice this next phrase. You have no part or share in this ministry. That's tough. You have no part and no share. What did Peter and John see? They saw right through him. They saw right through him. Okay? Because you're, notice the next phrase, you should highlight it, underline it in your Bible. Your what? Your heart is not right before God. What was wrong with his heart? Well, absolutely. It was all for him. Absolutely. He was not a humble spirit. You understand that? If he would have had a humble heart, he would have what? Come on. He would have renounced his what? His sorcery. Thrown away all his garbage, given it up completely, and been done. Correct? And that's still true today, folks. To come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to be what? Humble. You have to throw out the garbage of the past, whatever that is, whether that's lifestyle, whether that's attitude, whether that's practice, whatever. When a person comes to the Lord, you that person part of repentance is getting rid of the powers of darkness in one's life. And that is an ongoing process, isn't it, in our lives as believers? Because we're all susceptible to what? Picking up the things of Satan. Think that's happening in our world today? Oh, big time. Picking up the things of Satan. And by the way, they're out there in the world. And a lot of folks are picking them up. Because a lot of young people. You betcha. Yep. No, yeah, and hopefully the light will go on someday. Yep. Yeah. But anyway, just think about this, all right? Where are we here? Not repent. Verse 22, and this wicked of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Notice he, Peter calls him. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see, you should highlight this one. I see you are full of bitterness and here's a okay. Here's a great phrase, captive to sin. Isn't that a picture? Captive to sin. I'm afraid there are a lot of folks who are captive to sin, correct? We're captive, people are captive to an evil way of life. That can happen to believers easily, right? Yes, it could ruin our faith. 
I mean, we're inclined to sin. Let's admit it. We all have our weaknesses, correct? All right? But here Peter says you're captive to sin. Now, if you, to fight captivity to sin, what do you have to do? Repent and humble yourself. And part of repentance is changing and getting rid of that. Okay? All right. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. <laughs> when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Okay. Somebody exp Yeah. Yeah. That's still not no, that's not. I was, yes, we're coming to that. That's right. Because for Simon, it's all about Simon. Simon. See that? And that's a, you know, we're all inclined to be self consumed, aren't we? I mean, we live in a culture of self consumption. Correct? I, what I want. It's what I choose. I want what I want. And, you know, to a certain degree, I guess that's not so bad. I mean, it doesn't mean it's necessarily sinful. But the problem is, it easily turns to that, right? I want what I want. You're here for me. It's all about me. And, and that's dangerous. That's just simple. Let's go, let's go through this. So Peter and John are sent to Samaria. Why is that a brilliant move? to check out what's going on. Let's see what's happening. Maybe they heard about this, Simon. You know? When new mission starts come in, it's always good... By the way, let me say this in the church, about the church. It's always, you know, one of the dangers... Forgive me, and I, you know, if you want to send me an email on camera and tell me how bad I am, do so. <laughs> But let me just tell you, one of the dangers of preachers and churches be living under their own authority, an independent church, you know, I, like I started the church, one of the dangers is lack of humility, and it's all about me, and no one is there to correct me. Think about that. And there are many churches in America and probably around the world where the, oh, I started this church. This is my church. I'm in charge of the money. I'm in charge of the building. I own the property. Just think about that, folks. If, the, if, every, if I owned everything, let's just use this as a scenario. I started this church. I own everything. I'm in charge of the distribution of money. And you folks are here just to support the church. And tithe. And tithe. Now, think about that. That's dangerous because absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the wisdom in the church knows that. See, that's divine wisdom that knows you give a pastor absolute authority, what's he going to do? Or she? Going to take it and, and it'll turn bad because that's the, what the devil does. So the wisdom is Peter and John come to check it out and they, they see through this guy right away. They probably also did a lot of other things there to clean it out. But one of the best things is in the church, in my opinion, is that we're, it's just not mine, but you have other authority over us. You understand that? And in our church policy, in our church polity, there's a balance, Correct? between clergy and laity, correct? Everybody understand that? We Lutherans understand that. Where the pastor doesn't, he, he doesn't own the church, okay? It's a balance between the laity and the people, and that is a check system. Everybody understand that? And that is a good thing. You know, last Sunday I said how dangerous it is when pastors are when a pastor pounds on the table to get his own way. 
You ever seen that happen? Ooh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That yeah, that although there is some balance in that, I have found out. Yeah, very little. Anyway, so that's one thing, okay? Notice he is full of bitterness. Now let's talk about this Holy Spirit thing. Anybody got a footnote on that? What about this? That they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. They were baptized but didn't receive. Yeah. Well, like when let's say Delta Airlines were aware, they were baptized according to John, which was baptized to receive the Messiah. Yeah, okay. Like John's uh, preliminary baptism. Yeah. Yeah, okay. See, in, historically in the church, our baptism, you, you, when one is baptized, one all, not only becomes adopted as God's child, but also receives the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in one's life, okay? And you and I have that. I mean, I, I hope you believe and understand that you have that, all right? You also have, a, you know, the dark side too, all right? But anyway, I'm not sure what happened here. Uh, let me read, you, read my notes. Um, it seems that, um, well, what is it? Perhaps, where is this? Did Philip teach the, about the Holy Spirit? That's one of the questions. Did Philip talk about, was that part of his ministry and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives? Now, if we, we're coming to the Ethiopian eunuch who is baptized, and there's no question there. Okay, so something happened here, and I'm not sure what it was. I'd like to know, you know, one of the things that'd be nice to know what happened to this church in this city in Samaria, and what happened to Simon. But I'm, I'm afraid we just, we just don't know. Well, it could be that in Samaria, because Jesus went through there. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. That could be, yeah. I don't know. And the disciples were also baptizing prior to the crucifixion and resurrection, were they not? I'm sorry, what? Were the apostles baptizing? Oh, Ida, were the apostles baptizing before? Ida? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say no, but I can't swear to that. I'll say no, but it could be. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So anyway, this is a section... Um, uh, that is that is odd, okay? Uh, when Simon saw that the Spirit, notice verse 18, he saw the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands. He offered them money. You see that? And so he was after that power, all right? Uh, I have a note here that says, this was the Samaritan Pentecost that they now receive the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. All right? All right, let's move on. Uh, he, Philip and the Ethiopian. By the way, this is not Ethiopia that we think of. As I understand it, this is a part of Africa that is in the northern part more, okay? And the, the other thing, the, the other title of this is God opens the door to Africa. You know, we tend to forget that in the early Christian church in the first three centuries, there were a lot of believers in Africa. There were also a lot of believers in the Middle East. Okay, our present day Afghanistan, Iran, there were a lot of believers even all the way to India because that's where Thomas went, okay? And over the course of the centuries, guess what happened? Other powers came in that destroyed that Christianity, all right? So isn't it amazing? Here we have in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, God opens the door to Africa. We ought to, we ought to appreciate that. And how, well, anyway, let me go on. All right. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Ge Jerusalem to Ge Gaza, Gaza. So he started on it, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, all right? And this is, I have a footnote here that says, from the Upper Nile region, okay? Not, not Ethiopian, Central Africa, all right? 
an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, and the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So what do we know about this guy? He was? Oh, I don't know if he was Jewish. Okay. Well, I'm going to guess, I, and I, I think this is true, that he was a Gentile who, like others in the book of Acts, were Gentiles who came to accept the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as their God. Just, to, yeah, they were, he was a convert to Judaism. Okay, hang on. And so he was from Africa. He was a eunuch, probably, because he was serving in the queen's court for whatever the reason. All right? And why, what's he doing in Jerusalem? Could be. What's he doing in Jerusalem? Probably go, huh? Yeah, came to worship. So he's there as a Jewish believer. Okay, let's understand this. Here we have another Gentile, folks, okay? A Jewish believer who is there. And while he is there, what did he get? Yeah, he probably bought a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. By the way, in those days, you didn't go to Barnes & Noble to buy a book. <laughs> those were extremely, what? Rare, Rare and expensive. Yeah, well, of course he did. And maybe, as you say, he was sent, part of it, he was sent on behalf of the queen. Who knows? We, I don't know if we know that. I, I, you guys, we should check that in church history. Maybe there's a little follow-up on him. Hang on a minute. She had to give him a Permission to go. Yeah, yeah. She, well, yeah. Or she knew that, you know, he was Jewish, and so maybe he went every year. I mean, who knows? But he's a, he's a Jewish convert, a believer, devout, obviously, right? He's devout. He's there. He buys this book. And what's he doing? He's reading it. Okay? So he knew Hebrew, which also means he was educated. Thank you. This was not some schlup off the boat. All right? Now you like that word schlup? That's a good German word, right? Let's go on. So the Spirit says to Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now here, notice the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We want to talk, remind me to talk about that. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? Notice the conversation. We're going to come back to this. Notice how it begins. How can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Let's stop there. Now what do we learn from this encounter? Oh, come on, folks. No, 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 no. You're missing the point. We're, we'll come to the... Okay, let's go back to the beginning. Go back to verse, go back to verse 29. So what do we learn about this encounter? It's a guidance of the Holy Spirit. Can you say you've ever had that happen to you, where you are engaged with someone and you don't know how did this happen? I have had that happen in the office. We've had that happen. That is called a, a God thing or a God moment. You don't know why this happened, and, but it did. Okay? I think I had one of those recently. 
with a young man who was homeless. And he would come by and use our restroom. And he asked, one time he asked me to pray for him, to get out of his trouble. So I did, right on the spot, I, at the door, at the office door. I stood there, held the door, and we prayed. Never have seen him again. Never have seen him again. Which leads to me, me to think something happened. There mu and that he asked to f for a prayer. So he had a background, probably, in the church, and something happened. Now, I wish I would know what happened, but I don't. The point is, this is how God works. He puts you and me in situations, and we have to have eyes to see and not blow it off. Okay? And let me just say that to you because it would have been very easy, and I've learned this over time. I was never this, I'll tell you when I, never mind. <laughs> but I have learned this, and it would have been easy for me to say, uh, you know, no. <laughs> but I did. And when God puts you in that situation, that is the Spirit's guidance. You have no clue how this happened. And we've had that happen here on numerous occasions where people come, and, and I often think, God brought them here. God brought them here. And I don't know what that means, but we need to be what? Open, Open to it, right? All right, now, let's go on. Notice verse 30. What happens in verse 30? This is, this is how encounters, God moments, encounters by the Spirit work. What happens in verse 30? Ah, uh, yes, that's true, but you're missing a major important thing. Look at verse 30, people. He asks a question. That is huge. Engaging people with the gospel, one of the first things you ought to do is not tell them, but ask them. Ask them a question. Do you understand this? I got a, I got a question for you. What's bothering you? You seem troubled. Is something bothering you? You ever done that with people? I've done that. You better get ready to hear. <laughs> or, they, or they say, no, I don't want to talk about it. But you, if you open that door and say, you know, you just, I see heads nodding. Yes. You say, is something, bother, is something troubling you? And if they're ready, there's what? The door is open, yes. And then you can have a... Now notice verse 31. What happens in verse 31? He asks the question, how can I unless someone helps me? You understand? So now the conversation goes back and forth. You see that? comes back to Philip. So what did the guy do? Go to the top of the next page. What did he do? He invites him in, which means what? Now we're going to have a longer conversation. It could have been cut off, right? But no, it's not. So Philip climbs up. Philip's got to be ready to do what's going to happen, right? And now he's reading the scripture. Now we come to this. And of course, we know about this, right? This is Isaiah 53, if I remember, the suffering servant, right? Filled with uh, a messianic uh, things on the, on the, on the, on the cruci uh, passion of Christ. Verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Philip began with that very pa passage and told him, the good news about Jesus. While they're traveling along, probably the, the, the chariot or whatever it was, was moving along. Maybe it stopped. You see that? It starts by the Spirit putting, putting a person, to bringing two people together. Conversation begins by asking a question, and then it moves on. Doesn't always happen that way, but oftentimes it does. And that is the power and presence of the Spirit. 
the point, the reason I say this is you and I need to be aware of this and we need to be open to it and don't blow it off. Got it? All right. Well, boy, I'm wordy today. Okay. Let's move on. So as they traveled along the road, they came to water. Eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? He gave orders to stop the chariot. Both Philip and he went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. They came up out of the water in the Spirit of the Lord. You would suspect would what? Came upon the Ethiopian eunuch. But that's not what we're told. We're told the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all towns until he reached Caesarea. You know what happened in Caesarea? That's where, that's where he ended up. And he, had, he shows up again in chapter, I'll come to it. Let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right? He get, uh, let me get ahead of myself. Where are my notes? Okay, where are we? The Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, Philip and the Ethiopian. God opens the door to Africa. Uh, Philip's divine guidance. Okay, notice that. The divine guidance. Um, the Spirit tells Philip. Interesting, you gotta, you gotta be open to the Spirit's guidance. And you have to be available, right? And you have to be willing. Some of us are not willing to be used by the Spirit. We have the suffering servant uh, found fulfillment in the passion of Christ. Uh, this was Jesus who offered up his sins, told him the whole gospel. Philip baptizes him, okay? And the response is repentance and baptism. And uh, the, Philip keeps moving. And by the way, in, where is it? Chapter 21. Here we find, 20 years later, we find Philip in Caesarea where he has settled there and has daughters in his family. Okay? Any questions? There was something I wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah. Okay, go to the back of your study booklet, question 15. By the way, we're on study number six, right? The Ethiopian eunuch was probably one of a group called the God-fearers, Gentiles who were students of Judaism attracted by its faith in one God and by a high moral and ethical teaching. God-fearers would often attend the synagogue, read the Jewish scriptures. In contrast, proselytes were Gentiles who had been accepted fully into Jerusalem. They were circumcised, had taken up upon themselves the responsibility of keeping the law. Perhaps this Ethiopian had been denied the privilege of becoming a proselyte because of the physical mutilation, being a eunuch. Okay? What, okay, what evidence do you find? Anyway, I thought that was interesting, that he was probably what was called a God-fearer. Okay, remember that? There were those Gentiles who were fully incorporated into, into, Judaism, by pract circumcision and practice, then the God-fearers were not. Okay? But is, again, isn't it interesting how God uses Philip and moves him about? All right? And uh, any comments on this chapter, folks? Let's, this side. Any comments, questions over here? All right, any questions over here? So, next week, we're moving on to what? Probably the great changing point, chapter in the book. The conversion of, Saint, of Saul. Because most of the, I, have to, I shouldn't say most, but probably, yeah, probably most of the rest of the book is about his... Missionary journey. Okay? And by the way, during, even though the book of Acts you know, goes to this, there was a lot of other stuff going on among the believers as well. Everybody understand that? 
So probably what happened with Philip was not isolated. There were many others. It's just that Luke chooses to record that. All right? All right. So let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of life and faith that he brings into our lives. We thank you, dear Jesus, for being our Lord and Savior and for sending the Holy Spirit into our lives. Dear Holy Spirit, today we hear of your work in the lives of Philip and others and, and the saints of the early church. Dear Holy Spirit, use us. Use each of us in our own personal lives. Open our hearts and minds, dear Holy Spirit, to see opportunities, to see those God moments, those Holy Spirit moments, where you put us into other people's lives to be a witness to them in some fashion. Dear Lord, help us to be those kinds of people. Help us to be your witnesses on a personal level. Finally, dear Holy Spirit, we pray for all of your people here in these United States of America. Dear Lord, all those who seem to be going astray from the faith, who are walking away for numerous reasons. Dear Lord, today I want to pray for a revival in this land. Dear Holy Spirit, bring a revival to America and to American Christianity a revival that will bring folks back, a revival that reju will rejuvenate and enliven the faith for many that it appears has gone dead. Dear Lord, we pray for that revival. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a good week, everybody. Redo your work. I think chapter 9 is the next one, right? Just chapter nine, and uh, we've got we've got three more weeks. Okay, hasta la vista. Goodbye, everybody, on the world wide web.